so I'm really, really excited to have Sarah Greenberger Rafferty um, here to speak with us today. She is um, one of my favorite people, I think, in, in New York. She's so um, involved and collaborative and just um, super solid to do projects with and always involved in really, really interesting things and doing great work herself. Um, she's also an educator, so I know she understands uh, the pleasures of teaching and also the, the rigors um, and the schedule and everything else. Um, I've worked with her in a number of contexts. Um, she is Zooming to us today from, I believe, her studio in Brooklyn, New York. Is that right? Uh, she has a BFA from uh, RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design, and an MFA from Columbia University. And um, her work can be found in the permanent collections of the Guggenheim Museum, the HUD Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the RISD Museum, the Yale University Art Museum, um, and the Carnegie Museum of Art, among others. She was a co-founder of the artist book series, North Drive Press. And um, she's currently uh, the Director of Graduate Studies in Photography and an Associate uh, Professor at Pratt Institute in New York, which has a long and storied um, kind of amazing history in terms of the study of, uh, of photography. Um, before joining Pratt, she held teaching positions at Suffolk um, County Community College, City College, Columbia University, RISD, Parsons, Amherst College, and Hampshire College, where she was Associate Professor of Studio Art. Uh, she, Greenberger Rafferty was included in the 2014 Whitney Biennial and the 2014 Hammer Biennial, and um, I believe she has an upcoming solo exhibition that opens in the fall of 2021 at the Carnegie Museum of Art. So um, welcome, Sarah. Thank you for, for taking the time to be with us today and for this incredible show of yours that we have in the Commons Gallery right now. Um, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? It's good, you can hear? Okay. Um, thanks so much. Thanks for that uh, introduction. It's always so embarrassing, especially with the added Zoom um, deal of having to look at a picture of your face, but, um, but thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be beaming across the continent and then across some water um, to, to you guys who are in the middle of noon lunchtime and here it's about um, six, thanks to the recent daylight saving. Um, and it's just, I don't know, I, I had been hoping to be there in person. I've never been to Hawaii before. Um, and, and of course, one year later, we know what happened. So, um, so it was really, you know, it was sad on the on the sort of continuum of sad things that have happened in the past year. This was not that sad, but it was very, um, it was a, a regrouping to think of like what we could do over time and space. Um, thinking about the the particulars of basically having an exhibition um, by telephone or by by internet, um, by mail. Um, and so there is a sense of a kind of um, communique from here to there with, with this exhibition, which is really different than what I probably had imagined um, before. So um, I know we're gonna do, uh, Micah, you have some questions for me. So I'm going to be kind of brief and I brought some slides today. Um, also want to say really um, honored to be working with Micah and the Young Museum and this project, which, um, which has, um, you know, people that I know, Lucas and, and Stephanie, who have done exhibitions before. And um, it's just a, a really interesting premise that I'm really thrilled to be a part of. So Thank you, Micah. Um, and yeah, so I'm gonna show some slides. Um, I have to share my screen first. Mm, maybe the wrong, the wrong screen. I feel like this happens pretty often. Give me one more minute. Do you see the slide? Yeah? Or do you see my? Yes, I see it. 
<laughs> okay. Okay, very good. So I couldn't tell if you had my like presenter view or the regular view. Okay, so you're gonna see me looking this way because I have two screens set up. That's my my pro setup for the Zoom days. Um, but hopefully you're looking at the image and not my beady face. Um, so it looks like um, majority of the people signed on are, are people that are, are maybe um, in Hawaii. So hopefully you've seen this piece. Um, and basically, in making the exhibition that, that has to do with the premise um, of out of the camera beyond photography, I was thinking about the um, installation shots, uh, specifically, that's the way that I knew this space. And so I decided in consultation with Micah, um, you know, let's do something that would make sense, that would be, um, that would be sort of also, you know, doable from a distance, right? So not like shipping and shipping back big objects and having a complicated install that would be better if it was artist directed site specific. So here's, you know, one view, and this is a really um, special video that Micah sent, which kind of shows the dynamism of the exhibition. Um, you can see these kind of trapezoids that are kind of black bands. And that is part of the vinyl that's in two dimensions on the window, but it complicates the way that you see the three dimensional space of the gallery. And this is sort of looking through a kind of window, a, a, a hole a viewing space in the wall vinyl. And essentially the way I think about this exhibition is it's both one photograph and it's two photographs. It's the photograph that's on the wall and it's the photograph that's on the windows. And so this is the photograph that's on the wall and it's essentially a repeating pattern wallpaper that goes from the floor to eight feet high. Um, and on it are some graphic representations of pictures essentially. Um, here's what it looks like with a viewer to give you a sense of scale. Um, this is looking from outside in um, and with a focus on the window vinyl, which is um, basically like a kind of website gone haywire, kind of both of them. Um, and on the window are images of um, these cones that would say sanitized or disinfected. Um, and then on the wall, in addition to these graphic representations of, of um, pictures with kind of highlighter yellow instead of a shadow, and the image itself becomes a shadow, um, it's based on these um, images on the inside of these palettes, um, like makeup tester palettes that I took at a Sephora, like right before the pandemic, like March, I'm sorry, February, like 28th, 29th. Um, and together, this is like the view that is from the installation shots that I saw so that I could see what the space looked like so that the trapezoid kind of um, matches up to block out the floor. But as you could see from the video, if you go in a different position or if you're inside, it no longer matches up. And that's sort of on one level, my nod to the fact that I've only encountered the space through photography. Um, and it's really about this one view, um, but in reality, it kind of gets complicated. And I brought a few other works to share that relate to this. Um, and I also wanted to show some works that I've made in glass because I know that you guys have um, really fantastic glass facilities there, which I had been hoping to interface with. And I think originally Micah and I were discussing doing a project that, an installation that had some sort of glass photographic objects, which also was in keeping with the theme of beyond photography. Um, so these are glass pockets that are made from fused glass and inside photographic prints from these same testers um, from Sephora 
which are mounted to board, you know, slip in. And on the left is a kind of lightly tinted yellow glass. And on the two right pieces um, is a kind of opaline uh, translucent glass that kind of looks like plastic and they stick out. Um, here's an example of the, of the print, of the photo, the, the piece showing a little bit of an angle so you can kind of see the materiality. And here's an installation photo of the same, the two, two of those pieces installed on a, um, a wallpaper that I made called Workers and Catalogs. Um, so here's just another view of it. Um, and so I, I think about these wallpapers like that are at the Commons Gallery and this as sort of large aggregate photographs. Um, and they're often made up of multiples of archival images, cell phone pictures, et cetera. And it's really sort of part of my grappling with image culture and also just trying to make um, you know, sense of how do you make an image that isn't a singular image, but is made out of um, a bunch of images, a whole aggregation of images, and also making that become architecture or sculpture. Um, so here's some other details of this installation. And then I brought uh, a number of images and documents from this glass piece that I made in 2019 called The Velt. Um, and I just wanted to show uh, some of the process behind it. Um, because one of the things that I think is really interesting, it, especially in this idea of the exhibition that's up at the Commons Gallery right now, it's like, you know, there is some nod to the installation photograph. Um, and this is sort of the formal photograph of this piece. Um, but you can't really know everything about it from, from that photograph. So again, I have a kind of informal video that shows um, the reflective nature of the piece and the way it interacts with architecture. Um, and then some other details uh, of this piece using a decal process to get imagery on the glass and how the panels, again, just like the wallpapers, there's kind of an aggregation, a, a, building, a, a building of a bigger piece out of smaller panels. And, you know, part of it has to do, for those of you who are making art yourself, it's like, Part of it has to do with the limitations of what can fit in the kilns that I have access to and how do I make a scale that works within those um, details. And here's, so these are again, formal documentation, photography, and then here's, you know, a picture of me taking a picture and you can see the reflection of the rest of the space. Um, and then I just brought some of the working documents for the piece to show you how I kind of like construct it. Um, this was from a Adobe image search, stock image search of woman touching screen or woman touching. And um, it was really important to me, this piece was made in 2019 and it was really important to me that it was um, sort of a gendered body that was like to scale, but also when I started making it, I really was moved by the idea that there's this white woman with her back to the viewer. Um, and I think that that had something to do with a um, relationship to what I had seen over the past um, you know, number of years. And I wanted this kind of technology evocation, like a touch screen, sort of like a, a dumb, a dumb phone or a dumb smartphone. It's an arrested image on glass, unlike our phones. Um, so I started with this image and then I use a decal process, which has to be on a certain size of paper. So I break it all up and tile it and then I maximize. So these are the files that I sent to the decal printer um, and then piece it back together. So this 
gives you an example. And then here's the map that I made in Illustrator that shows you like what the whole image is going to look like without the glass. And then when I was kind of deciding that I wanted it to be black and reflective or gray and thinking about that. And then I print these out as at scale in my studio so I can get a feel of it without like going into the major materials, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then here's like a Photoshop with the stock glass before I cut it and fused it. Um, putting the decals together. And finally, you know, going piece by piece into the kiln. Um, another just sort of like studio shot of the, the silver reflection. And then finally, when I send it to exhibition, um, this is the map that shows you the order in which the panels go so that uh, it has a really clear sense of how to install it. All of the works in this piece, going back to the original image, um, they are on cleats because it's opaque glass, you can't see them. And so they all, hang on French cleats on the wall in this gridded relation with one another. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I brought for today to share. Um, and I'm gonna stop the share. Oh, it's so nice to have the share. I like seeing the images. Oh, do you want me to go back to the share? I mean, we, we might relaunch it once. Okay. Um, we get into some questions. Um, I guess I, I wanted to start with um, your use of glass as well, and maybe just consider what it means to um, to work on that as a as a kind of substratum. Um, obviously, in the history of photography, we have all of these alternative surfaces on which photographic imagery appears, be it um, you know famously salted paper or leather and we certainly do have um, glass as this kind of key element to the photographic process in the 19th century and um, I guess I wanted to ask you about glass in particular as a as a photographic medium. Yeah so I mean I started thinking about glass a lot because of um, I, I was working a lot in plastic and I was working a lot in plastic clear plastic specifically. So transparency and translucency was really important to me. I don't have to go on a big tangent about it, but um, it was actually, you know, throughout my whole career with regard to photographs, I've been working with images of things that are kind of like damaged or um, punctured or wounded and that has been like a um a strategy to sort of talk about uh issues that concern me etc and at some point um i was in oregon and i saw like a melted bottle or something like at a gift shop and I was like, oh yeah, I mean, glass is something that gets completely um, destroyed at, while it's being formed. Like it's like molten and, um, and ooey and gooey and it's like, you can deform something. Um, and so I put that kind of in the back of my mind that was maybe 2014 and then the more that I interacted with my phone, my black, you know, black square, um, the more I thought like, because when I was working with plastic, I was thinking a lot about monitors and screens. And then I was just thinking about this like tactile relationship with glass and this attachment to glass. And then, so first it was just that. And then the second order was thinking about it like intellectually and with the history of photography and thinking about glass plate negatives. And again, the way that like the slowness of that 
Um, you know, I just remember in photo school really remembering about um, carrying glass plates up the mountain and taking all this time to develop them and um, just how it was just this really tactile and chemical process. Um, and so it's basically the convergence of the history of lenses and the history of photography, chemical photography, glass plates, et cetera, um, converging with the super futuristic cell phone and gorilla glass and that kind of intellectually um, fit into the things that I'm concerned with in my work and in, in um, the history of my work, but also this visceral relationship to like, unlike plastic, um, this is like an elemental thing that isn't like related to, directly related to like a synthetic 20th century um, invention, but it has a more ancient invention and history. And then it's also like just the extreme physicality of like turning something into a kind of liquid to turn it back into a solid and the way in which the, um, the imagery and the glass can kind of like be deformed and reformed. And then I also really liked the way in which glass um, showed its damage so that like you can never truly hide a cut or a break. And so I fuse that back together and think about those as like formal elements. I think that answers your question. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, reference your, was it your 2018 show at Rachel Uffner Gallery where you first presented some of the, the glass works? And you didn't really bring in a slide of it, but um, the install of that show was so beautiful and really, I think, um, for me, bridge that line between thinking, kind of evoking the Julia Margaret Cameron, like glass plate negatives, which were famously, you know, kind of had thumbprints on them and were cracked and damaged, but made these beautiful prints. And then also just the existence, you know, the ubiquitous by that point, certainly existence of the cell phone with its own glass surface that we're constantly kind of trying to shield from like mine is cracked right here. And, um, and it, 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 launched into a new thinking, um, I think for some of us about, about the photographic image um, in that uh, I think we had been operating in this 20th century paradigm in which the negative was celluloid and the, the, the film was 35 millimeter and like flexible and windable. Um, but then I, I think that show really made the point in some ways that actually we're working with um, with transparent glass much more in our daily lives, that it wasn't just thinking about the, the monitor, but thinking about the, the sort of technologies of display behind the cell phone that was, you know, had become by 2018 a, a ubiquitous part of image culture and how much that was um, actually a glass-based technology. Um, I think that I wrote down the quote, the Times, uh, the New York Times said that show functioned as an update of the state of photography. And I really, um, you know, it was high praise and I really feel like um, it still resonates with me. Um, and I feel like the, having invited you, the way that you deal with the glass front of the Commons Gallery um, for me has really been a revelation. And, and I haven't seen someone, you know, do that kind of thinking about transparency um, in that exhibition surface before. Um, so I really thank you for that. Yeah, thank, I mean, that's also the, I mean, it's so cliche, but it's like just the problem solving of how to do something interesting when you can't go there and you can't really embody the space when you're when you're an object maker. And and yeah, I really love the opportunity to turn the surface of the gallery, the window, um, the windows into a glass piece, essentially. Um, and I don't know that I would have even been on board with that if I wasn't thinking about um, the space and thinking about the prompts of this exhibition series, um, because I think it's so easy to think of, you know, imagery or signage on a glass window in the context of retail. I mean, especially 
a lot of the imagery on the wall is coming from retail, like I mentioned Sephora. And that was something that I've been thinking about a lot over the past year. And I think it relates to photography and desire and our phones and the fact that like everything happens on the phone or the screen between shopping and sexting and making dinner and you know getting updates from our loved ones um but the thing the reason it's so dumb like i do like the way that these um these makeup palettes look formally obviously but also um the thing that i was really thinking about both before the pan before like the real shutdown the hard shutdown when I was taking them, but also afterwards, which happened in very close succession, as I explained, because it was, you know, February 28th, 29th, because it was leap year last year, or two, yeah, last year, or, you know, March 6th, 7th, 8th through 12th, when everything, at least in New York, was like going kind of haywire. Um, on the one hand, I was like, oh, this is so interesting, because it's this like, tactile color because they're things that you're meant to like put your hand on to to interface with to test it out and then noticing while I was processing why did I take all these pictures oh that's never going to be a thing again like touching a thing and putting it on your face like that's not a thing that's this is going to be a major thing that changes it's so trivial but it also has gotten me thinking through the past um, couple, the past year about the tactility of shopping. Um, and so I, I basically started talking about how maybe I didn't want, um, like I wouldn't have gone to putting like a vinyl on a window because it would remind me like very much of an advertisement having to do with like, you know, a sale at a Sephora, at a Gap, at a, you know, Bloomingdale's, whatever. Um, or the mall, but I'm realizing that the pandemic is really ending the tactility of retail and how that, you know, is a sort of back to the arcades, you know, it's, it's sort of a 20th century thing. And I think it's just sort of like finally hitting me, mm -hmm. um, the difference in our common life in terms of um, merchandising. Um, and you would go back to the relationship between photography and desire and merchandising. And, um, but then I'm also thinking about like the, the publicness of that, the relationship to public of being in public. Um, so it seems quite stupid and trivial, but I, it's kind of like fanning out to all of these stuff other concerns for me. Um, I, I wanted to bring up um, in terms of your thinking about it's, it's really interesting because I'm thinking also now about the, the 19th century technology of the shopping mall and um, some of the texts that we read in my um, 19th century art history class like uh, Zola, The Lady's Paradise, something that we're looking at today where he describes the kind of voluminous displays of stuff um, imported and kind of cheaply made fabrics and, and gaudy colors and, and um, ready-made women's wear that are kind of spilling out of these, uh, the new technology of the shopping mall in Paris. And I guess, you know, you're right, maybe we're not going to return to that level of tactility and, and its relationship to the body in the same way again. Um, I hadn't thought about that looking at your makeup palettes, but, but that's a very um, kind of haunting point. Um, I wanted to give you a chance to maybe talk about Sarah Charlesworth uh, for a, min a moment. Uh, I know you're um, kind of often called upon to speak on her work um, and have a relationship with her estate and um, and just to, to speak about her influence and importance to you as an as an artist and, and um, as yeah. your new body. Yeah, thank you. I love any opportunity to talk about Sarah. Um, and so Sarah, Charlesworth, I first encountered her, she, when I was at RISD as an undergrad, she was working with the grads there. So 
Um, I suppose I kind of like knew some of the grads and knew that she was working with them, but she was the faculty um, speaker, you know, I guess much like this. Uh, she was speaking during the lecture series. Um, I, I don't really remember if it was during my junior or senior year, but at some point during my um, time at RISD, she spoke and so that would have been in the um, late 90s. And, um, and it was really a revelation, the way that she spoke about um, images, image culture, um, you know, and the way she speaks about seeing herself, her self-identification as, you know, an artist who uses photography, right? And I think that, you know, in the program that I went to, there was a sort of like two, I guess, you know, it's the program started by Carrie, ha Carrie Hallahan, Harry Callahan. Um, it's the program that is like deeply embedded in modernism, but then there's like this really um, righteous, like postmodern women, like Deborah Bright was teaching history of photography. Um, Sarah Charlesworth was working with grad students, um, Ann Fessler, um, et cetera. And so there were the, and then there was like, you know, a, a set of people who had gone to Yale and, you know, studied with Todd Papa George and, and Richard Benson, et cetera. So it was like kind of this mashing of um, artistic parentage of, of modernist and postmodern parentage. But, um, and so you find your own way as a young artist, but then hearing Sarah speak about her work and just how precise and how um, cerebral and how analytic, but also how just breathtakingly beautiful and material her work was, I think was like really important. And then as it happened, um, we had studios in the same building in Brooklyn. Um, and when I was doing North Drive Press, I reached out to her and paired her with another artist, Sarah Vanderbeek, to, to speak um, and, you know, try, tried not to like super fan about her. Um, but I have another really, my favorite, one of my favorite Sarah Charlesworth stories, not really about her work, but um, just kind of about artistic heroes is so soon after she lectured at RISD, I didn't have like a studio visit with her or anything. I just knew who she was from this lecture um, because, you know, it's like, how did you know about artists in the 90s? They were either like in a magazine your, or your teachers told you about them or they lectured at your school. Like there was no like internet rabbit hole or Instagram to like know what, what artists were like, or you saw them at the MoMA or you saw them at the Whitney. Like that's how you knew about artists in total. Um, but I was, um, I, I, I met, this filmmaker, Amos Poe, who was teaching at NYU. And I happened to know that that was Sarah's husband. I didn't know that they had broken up at that time, but I met him and every, there were all these like young NYU people that were like fanning out about him. And someone's like, oh, this is Amos Poe. And I was like, oh my God, are you married to Sarah Charlesworth? Tell me everything about her. And that's like one of my favorite New York stories. Um, about Sarah, but yeah, so I think that um, that those qualities that I just said about about Sarah are the things that you know I I take a little bit from all of my artistic heroes. Someone who is engaged in teaching, someone like I said, who who is like analytical, precise, but also has a kind of attention to materiality and using beauty as a critical tool. Um, those are the things that are important to me. And, um, and yeah, I, I really loved Sarah, Char love Sarah Charlesworth's work. And I loved knowing her for the kind of 10 years that I knew her. Um, I think we'll transition to questions from people um, shortly. I know I'm always excited to see people's faces and just like weird um, 
separate age. Um, maybe while people are gathering questions, oh, I see one already. Um, can can I ask you briefly about North Drive Press, just because you mentioned For it? Sure. Yeah, a hundred times. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I also think about it as this way of maybe disseminating artist work or disseminating images. Um, I know a lot of my closest friends are people who have run kind of galleries or off spaces or curatorial projects. And I very much think of North Drive Press as one of those um, kinds of projects. You worked with a broad range of artists and um, did so regularly over a, a decade, I think. Uh, le way less than that, but um, but but yeah, it feels like it, or it, it has tentacles. Um, but yeah, uh, so North Drive Press was actually started by artist Matt Keegan, and then he invited me to, to join him and co-edit and co-organize and co-curate. Um, and that was around 2005 or six. And we worked on um, two proper issues together and then a bunch of offshoots. Um, I think actually probably where we formally met, I think was on one of the NADA buses, I wanna say in like 2006 or something. Um, so we did sort of like art fair presentations to raise money for the projects and also to engage. But yeah, I think of it like, um, it was, so North Drive Press, you, you should go to the website and hopefully someone will put the website in the chat um, because it's an amazing archive of artist to artist interviews and being like, you know, 10, 15 years out from all of those issues and you see all the artists and you're like, of course this artist and of course that artist. But at the time it was like artists who, um, maybe didn't have magazine features or monographs. So we looked at it like a time capsule. Um, the first project I did for North Drive Press was in 2005 before I was the co-editor. I interviewed, actually Carol Beauvais and I interviewed each other. Um, and that was like before she had been on the cover of Art Forum and um, it just, we kind of knew each other through mutual friends and we were both living and working in Red Hook. So, you know, it's like this time capsule because you fast forward, whatever, 15, 16 years. And it's like, oh yeah, of course, Carol Beauvais has like caryatids like in the front of the Met Museum in New York, right? But um, it's, and it's the same thing for a lot of those artists and so I think Matt and I really liked the idea of, um, we used to say sort of like as a riff on FUBU, which was really big in our youth, like, which is for us, by us. Um, we'd be like for artists, by artists. And it was basically like, we were editors, but we were like, what do you wanna do? Let's make it happen. And we made multiples and interviews and artist texts. And, um, and it was a way to really like help I don't even want to say young artists, but artists make things or be in dialogue. And yeah, it's a, um, I think of it as a time capsule. And we just like a kind of attacked it like an artwork. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a really formative experience for me. Um, okay, I guess, uh maybe Gay Chan can pop up and ask her question. Are you out there, Gay? Sorry, no. I, now I have to get back to my question. Oh, if it's possible to say something about the ratio of your um, empty rectangles and whether the resolution of the source images matter. Um, okay, so when you say the ratio, do you mean like, the the aspect ratio yeah so um you know i can't remember the exact size how it turned out but also remember i haven't seen the piece in real life <laughs> um but uh i can't remember the exact size but you know I, I do kind of peg my work often to like standard photo sizes so um and obviously portrait uh portrait uh orientation and so, I don't know, maybe someone could go in there and measure it. I can't remember what the exact scale is or I can look on my computer file, but, um, 
but it's meant to be like a 24 by 30, you know, picture, but the shadow of the picture. Um, so that's that. And then the resolution of my source images, and I'm assuming that you mean like the pixel resolution. Um, yeah, so those images in the wallpaper are all images that I took on my iPhone. And so that dictates the resolution. Normally I like to do things like one to one, like a hundred percent scale. This one got a little out of hand and a little bit like fantastical. Um, and in a way I wasn't as much thinking about the printed resolution as you know, I was really thinking about the the dissonance between the thing as a thing, the material reality of being in this space with this like incredible sunshine and, uh, and in a space that has pedestrians walking through it um, and the documentation photography. So, I guess I was sort of, so is there content embedded? Um, I think the, yes, I do think there's content embedded. I think like, I can't know all of it before I do it because like, I didn't even know if this would work. So I was like, okay, let's do this. And for the students, especially, or, or the artists who are, um, you know, making their first shows and projects, um, you know, there's like the material realities of like, what's the budget? What's the material you can use? Like, how, what's the time scale for shipping and the cost for shipping? Like, what's the easiest way to do something? And so that all goes into the design, design of the piece. And um, yeah, so, and then for the window piece, it's all from a screenshot. So if my screen resolution is say like, I don't know, it's probably like 2200 by something. I don't know, like it's an iMac, I can look up the resolution, but I don't know it offhand. Um, and then, you know, just thinking like, okay, what if this went, um, what if this went, became a, an object? And so um, I don't have images of it in my, slideshow but actually what I did to test these two things were I took the file that I made the wallpaper in um, and I made I took sections of like 20 by 24 inch selections and I printed those out to see what that would look like on regular paper just to kind of see and I was like okay good and then for the window um, in my studio, I have like a, a door window because I'm like the ground floor kind of, it's not quite a storefront, but there's like a little window. And so I made, I made a section of the window and I put it on the window and sort of saw what it looked like and saw if it was like too low res, I would have been like, okay, this doesn't work. But I was like, this is fine. Um, but it was funny because the day that I picked up the, test print. It was a really insane snowstorm. Um, and so I was like, well, it's never going to look like this in Hawaii. <laughs> you know, there's like ice on the window right outside. Um, so you can only like approximate so much, but I hope that answers your question. I hadn't realized, but I think also there's a resonance with the way it does look like a commercial storefront to a certain extent. You know, you could imagine it being a, I don't know, some kind of shop, like a coffee shop or or something, but because so many things have been closed here and, and everywhere, um, and because our galleries are closed and you can view them just from the outside in, there's this feeling of recognition, like, oh, right, it's a, it's a closed space. It's a, um, it kind of has both that invitation and that uh, kind of resistance um, at the same time that feels very current. Uh, other people, other questions um, you can ask about. I know we've had a lot of 
questions about and just kind of enthusiasm about the the installation um or anything anything at all um sarah you know uh runs a, a an mfa program uh <laughs> so in photography so it's i i do think of her as a chance to um to ask a variety of questions uh Nenea, can you can you pop up sorry or you don't have to also if you don't feel comfortable or you can just do voice hello hey yeah, yeah can okay. so sorry video says that it stopped but i i i can cl clarify some of this question i just really like um how you are treating the the glass window of the commons gallery and also like your iphone um photography material can you talk a little bit about the the kind of like personal subjectivity that that might be relevant or or is it just talking really about photography and and i just really want to um say i super enjoy the shadow of the photo that you have um that's what i really respond to as a painter and if you can kind of comment on that um thank you so much what a great question and what a great observation um yeah i mean the way that i like talk about it most often is um that there's like a set of inputs and then the work is the output but there's like so many inputs which have to do with like things i read the work that i do as a professor and as you know um an artist or even the you know the way that i interface with my family um the the novels that i read the articles that i read the television shows that I watch, which is like most television that's ever been produced, I've watched, um, you know, films. And I, I think of all of these things and then I'm not necessarily illustrating anything, um, but it comes out in the work and it sort of like is, um, you know, I don't want to use the word like magical, but it's like, I'm not writing a position paper. I don't need to make an argument. I don't need to like substantiate an argument. And part of the thing I like about making artwork is um, the sort of thinking through making that happens. Um, and so, yes, 100% my personal subjectivity, which, you know, is sort of both unnameable, but also nameable yeah. as, um, you know, like a, Brooklyn says hi. I don't know if you heard that bus honking, um, but that's also nameable as like um, you know a middle-aged uh, white woman living in Brooklyn. You know what I mean? Like, um, so it, it it totally runs the gamut. And um, and yeah, I I think that with the pictures, the pictures with the shadow, the highlighter shadow, like. Um, it's something that also I'm like, okay, let's see what happens with this. It could work, it could not work. It could look like this, it, but I wanted to see what it looked like. And so that's also, you know, sometimes those artists who work in studios, like sometimes you just try something. Yeah, that's, that's excellent about trying something because um, it really does remind me of the studio. And, and maybe a part of being isolated too. <laughs> yeah, we all know that so much. And I think that um, that's sort of like, I know no one's explicitly asking for advice, but my best advice for people in doing exhibitions is you really have to think that it's something that you're gonna do again and that you're trying something in the true sense of an experiment um, because I think that it's the best way to really like learn something. And I think that that's really a huge part of art making and being a human in general. Um, and I think that there's so much anxiety around exhibitions and success on um, good and bad that, um, often people stop themselves from trying things that they don't know how they're gonna be. And I think it's something also that comes from 
at this point, like two decades of exhibition making and art making, I feel that I finally have a deep, like spatial material confidence from the embodied knowledge that I have having made shows and works. That doesn't mean it's always gonna like succeed or land or communicate in a way. Um, but I just think it is very important to try things um, and, you know, have, have a lot, like with the inputs, have really rigorous inputs that get you to that experimentation. But, um, but yeah, that's very important to me. Um, I think we have time for another um, question or two. I know people, I have one on behalf of people, if people are kind of gathering um, thoughts or if anyone just wants to raise their hand and jump in, you could do that too. Um, but I was just thinking about our own um, students who are uh, in this weird year constrained um, and doing uh, kind of post MFA solo exhibitions in the space right after your show comes down, which are also constrained by not having a public inside, um, you know, and particularly after making work over a series of three years where I think you really imagine people, you know, the work hanging on the wall maybe and people going in and walking up to it. Um, do you have, uh, you know, any advice to people who are about to um, embark on that process? Uh, you know, I guess superficially for me, having just done a show yeah. in this space, but also as someone who's working with MFA students during this weird time right now as well. Yeah, totally. Our students are having um, a big group show in a sort of like hollowed out um, warehouse space and they started installing on Monday. Um, and I think that, so my first bit of advice is to really, really, I think your generation or not in age, but the generation of people that are finishing their um, MFA right now, which is like so amazing. Like you saw even that video that I had of that glass piece, the Velt, which was just from this past summer when it was installed during the pandemic. Um, I think that like video and multimedia uh, documentation is going to be really a major thing that like in the same way that, you know, um, looking at archives of artists who were major mid-century artists. It's like you have the one slide or the one four by five chrome of like the image that would be reproduced in a catalog or on a poster because it was very cumbersome um, and you had to pick the singular image. And again, to my idea of aggregation, like there's not, the singular image is beautiful and it is still going to be used, but you have no idea what's going to happen. Like you might want, um, you know, because it's so accessible to have a hundred images of your show, you know, or a hundred images and a video. Um, I have this in my studio because I'm testing it out. We got this for the students. It's like a video. What's that? Is it a GoPro? What is that? It's like, it's not like, it's like a GoPro, but it's not a GoPro. It's, um, it's a little camera that like basically gimbals itself. It, it steadies itself. So it's like a, a handheld like steady cam basically so that you can do like an exhibition walkthrough. Um, so I would do that. So that's like very concrete and um, not like philosophical. And then the other thing I would say is I would, you know, process the loss of what you thought you were going to have. Um, and then move on to what you do have. And I think that that happens in life and in an art career so often. Um, it's really extreme with all of the isolation and all of the loss that we've all gone through over the past year, like the real loss, the loss of life, um, the loss of, of even being able to say goodbye to people who are passing away. You know, that's all really real and it's really, intense and it's an intense thing to take into this project. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think, I think my best advice is like, 
again, like experiment and figure out what I'm just for a shorthand, I'm saying your generation, like what this generation of art documentation is going to be, because I think that's, gonna, I think that's like, I want to know, <laughs> I want to know. And I think that the MFA students who are finishing now all over the country and the world are going to show us the way for that. Um, and the same thing goes for, you know, are you going to produce a podcast talking about your exhibition? Are you going to have an audio recording of your exhibition? Like just even if they never make the light of day, like what are these other ways that we're going to archive and commemorate things? Um, and also, you know, it's an ultimate learning experience. So as long as you're gonna see it and, and experience it and see what it looks like, that's, that's really the main thing. I think um, it really is something to put an exhibition up and I don't think you know what the work is until you have it out of the studio and in a space. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else have another I have, an, I have another question. I love hearing from Sarah um, so much. Um, could I ask you about the pandemic, just how the pandemic has been for you with your practice? Yeah, um, so the pandemic has been difficult, especially because of the beginning of um, the just intensity of New York City. Um, but I have to say that everyone in my immediate family is safe and living. Um, every, I, I've, I've been housed, I've been fed, um, I've had a job. And so I think that on the, on, the, on, the, on the face of it, that's basically all great and the best I could hope for. Um, I think that, you know, being an educator, was one way in which, um, while being, you know, COVID safe in these kind of Zoom things, I could engage in caring for my community. So I think that I was really engaged over the past year with um, stabilizing and working on behalf of our students um, to, and also colleagues to sort of both reinvent whatever we do and also just have a stable caring presence. So a lot of my energy and work has gone into that over the past year. Um, because I'm working in larger scale glass, um, I, I work in shared studios and I haven't really been able to go in there for the past year. Um, I'm now uh, fully vaccinated, so I'm a little bit more comfortable um, and my household is on the way to being fully vaccinated. So I'm a little bit co more comfortable going into group settings, but, um, but that's really changed. And then I also had a lot of opportunities either canceled or turned into like online things. And even the sort of, like I said, we totally changed the idea for this show. Um, and so you just kind of like adapt, but it's been, a pretty good time to reflect. And also, you know, I had a really sort of like mentally scary time at the beginning when you really have no idea what's gonna happen. And just to, to know that you're like resilient and you're gonna do, you're gonna, as long as your like needs are met, you're gonna survive and then, and then worry about thriving after. So, um, so that's how the pandemic's been for me. I've been very lucky, just very, very lucky. Thank you so much. Um, I guess this is a good time to kind of, um, oh, I'm sad to let you go. <laughs> well, I'll um, be back with the students, I think, in a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, let me, uh, once we get off the Zoom, call you or text you back about that. I have okay. Charlie communicating with me with me by phone about that um thank you everyone so much for for coming on and i know again that everyone is kind of gearing up for their own um projects and exhibitions at this point in the year right now and also maybe finally looking forward to some other um you know kind of in-person opportunity <laughs> um so i wish you all the best with your show um at the carnegie coming okay. up
it's so exciting and i just i love what you've done for us here it really is um magnificent i, I wish you could be here to see it in person and thank you oh and i should really thank wayne for the it stall and maybe there's other people that i don't know about um, I, I think you've been asking Kel Kelly Claridge, our uh, an MFA grad, to take install photos. Yes. Like, I think Thank she did you so much. And I think the co the talk gives us some context about why that's that's happened so like frequently with this particular show. But um, yeah, think and so I really just want to thank you for putting together such a great um, final exhibition for us in this series. Um, it's it's really seen made me see the space in a whole new way. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and. Um for organizing this i'm 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 really i'm thrilled to be in dialogue and and uh, hopefully i'll be able to come there as a human at some point we'll have you here working in glass okay thank you everyone <laughs>